Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All right, let's get a little more audience energy. Good afternoon. That's better. It is such a privilege to have Wendy Kopp and Richard Barth here. I've admired their work as long as I've known of their work, uh, which has been for about a decade and a half now. Um, Wendy, I don't think you know this, but you actually partially ruined my senior year of college. No. Yeah, so I was, I was writing my thesis, and I was pretty excited about it. And then I had an advisor say, you know, Wendy Kopp's thesis led to Teach for America. And I felt like I was wasting my senior year. No. But I, I think the work you've done is extraordinary. And I would love to have you just tell us a bit of the story of how it came to be. Sure. Um, well, I was a senior in college and just thought of this idea. And it came to me because on the one hand, you know, just as a concerned college student, I was becoming you know, more and more focused on just the inequities in our country. Um, I was a public policy major, so was taking courses on it, organized a conference on the disparities in education in our country during my senior year. Um, and at the same time, our generation was known as the me generation. You know, supposedly we just all wanted to go work on Wall Street. And it just didn't resonate with me. I felt like I was one of thousands of people out there on campus just obsessing with how we could actually make a real difference in the world. And I started thinking the issue actually was not the generation, but rather the recruiters who were all investment banks and management consulting firms banging down our doors saying, commit just two years to work in our firms. Um, and, and all this came together one day and I just thought, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit just two years to teach in urban and rural communities? Um, I needed a thesis topic, decided to propose this and became really obsessed and I've been obsessed ever since. But with both the impact I thought it could have in, in the short run in, in the lives of kids and in communities, but also thinking what this would do to kind of reshape the priorities of a generation of all these, quote, future leaders, you know, and, and to ultimately change the consciousness of the country. So anyway, it was one of these things that was just meant to happen. The timing was so perfect. I swear, if I spent half the time researching the thesis trying to find the person who was surely starting this. Like, I, it just seemed like it was so obvious it had to happen. And I think if I hadn't persisted, someone else would have done it within six months. I mean, it was just every star was aligned. I, I don't believe that for a second, but more it's on that in a though. moment. Yeah. Uh, Richard, you, you run one of the most amazing educational organizations on earth. How did you end up where you are? <laughs> so, so uh, you know, their origin stories, hers is phenomenal, mine is like the, the exact opposite. Uh, I, uh, I was, when I was in college, I helped start an organization that was um, preparing young kids in Boston to be able to go to college who were not getting any of the guidance they needed. And I started that organization, uh, this would have been in 1986, did that for three years. I graduated, I went traveling, I had no idea what I was gonna do next. My mother <laughs> cut out from the New York Times a little article uh, about some young recent graduate from Princeton who was starting something called Teach for America. She said, you might be interested in this. So I came back uh, to the States and tried to get a job at Teach for America. Um, and I went in and interviewed, and I was, this is now my wife, but at the time, it was just Wendy. And I interviewed. And I thought to myself, we don't need another white guy from Harvard, so <laughs> now. <laughs> so, true story, I interviewed, and then um, I thought, oh, that was a great interview, I'm sure this will all work out. A week later, I call, and I just get, you know, delayed, and there's all sorts of explanations. And um, someone I knew from college actually was there, and she went in and said, uh, Wendy, there's this guy, uh, Richard, on the phone again, and he's still looking for a job. And she said, this is great, because we're desperate. Just take him. <laughs> this was months later, like a couple months later. So, I'm like, sure. <laughs> uh, that's really the beginning of my journey. And so I helped uh, uh, Wendy and, and a bunch of other people get Teach for America off the ground and uh, was there for the founding six years. And then, you know, uh, over the last 13 years, I've been building KIPP from a smaller network to now this network of what will be 224 um, schools uh, this summer. So. so you've both been in education now for almost three decades. What do you think it's going to take to give every child an opportunity for a great education? And how optimistic are you now relative to when you started? Hmm. Uh, I'll start with the, 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 the real thing I think we're still battling is just a battle for belief that something different is possible. And, from where I sit, we know now something different is possible, so I have a ton of optimism uh, that we can create um, opportunity and access for 
millions of children in America, I'll let Wendy talk about it around the globe, who don't have it today. Um, but I still think the evidence is uh, far too often people all across the country still are going to bed at night thinking we're doing the best we can. And the evidence is, because the evidence of that fact is that people aren't um, doing what it would take. They aren't changing um, the things that would need to be changed um, in order to make uh, an opportunity to great, for a great education available to, to every single child in the country. Uh, just speaking in the little world you know, that I operate in, uh, today there are 70,000 plus families on waiting lists for our schools. And then I think about the battle to actually open schools to meet that need and the, the amount of uh, lift it takes and the challenge and the resistance uh, and, and the, the doubt, uh, and the naysayers, and I still think people, people are not convinced that something fundamentally different is possible. And uh, I, I look at many of the debates um, that we still have in this country, and I think um, they all come down to a belief and whether people think kids growing up everywhere in America um, have the chance to, to pursue their dreams and be a big part of this, uh, the future of the country. That's the biggest battle we have, still people believing in every part of the country that something different is possible and then acting on it. I mean, I think this challenge which exists in this country and, and really all over the world um, of the fact that the circumstances of kids' birth predict their educational outcomes and life outcomes, like it's a massive and, and complex set of issues, right? It doesn't start in classrooms or schools. It starts way outside of them with whole segments of kids just facing a lot of extra challenges, the functions of poverty, discrimination, et cetera. And, you know, they're showing up at schools that were never set up to meet their extra needs. And there's a whole, as you say, Richard, prevailing ideology about the potential of kids that kind of fuels the whole thing. So very complex. Um, I guess what we've seen is that we need to take it on in its full complexity, right? Like, we're not gonna solve a problem like that by giving every kid a laptop or by fixing the teachers. It's gonna take changes at every level of education, across sectors, at every level of policy. Um, but what we've seen is that with enough leadership, we can make a huge difference. And I guess that's, you know, this is, this is my core conviction. Like, I, I've become all the more optimistic and all the more convinced. I mean, I think there's a very real question. Will we be able to, you know, mobilize that level of leadership? But, but it is possible, and, and it's within our reach. It's just a question of are we going to decide to do it? Um, yeah. Wendy, you wrote a great piece about how it really takes a village, that it's not just a school, but it's a whole ecosystem that's responsible for developing and educating kids. And I figured there's, there's no better way to understand that village than to go into your own home, both of you. Um, you are the biggest power couple in education. You have four kids. Um, I want to know how you have parented them, because if any kids are going to be in a great position educationally, it's your four. So can you please enlighten us about how to be better parents? Or not. What's the phrase, like, you know, I can't remember the saying right now, like... The, the cobbler's child has no shoes. Literally, one of the parents of of my kids' friends asked me if she thought, if I thought this might be a case of that. I'm like, um, I hope not. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, um, I don't know. I mean, okay, I'll, I'll share one thought. I mean, we have four kids, um, and maybe I think personally, I mean, therefore there's no pressure on any one of them to be perfect. And I mean, I know myself, I knew I would be an obsessive mom, and I'm glad I don't have to, you know, like literally, now I feel like we have created an environment which makes it much easier for someone like me to just be very supportive of kids developing at their own pace and finding their own way to their passions. And so that, that's honestly one, <laughs> one thought that comes to mind. Another is, um, I mean, we, we were at dinner one night um, with our kids on vacation, and this is maybe not a good question to ask your kids, I'm not sure, but glass of wine in, we were like, so when you're parents, what is the one thing you'll do differently and what's the one thing you'll do the same? <laughs> um, thank heaven this worked out and we survived the night. But, um, <laughs> you know, so we were started with the question of what will you do the same? And interestingly, our three boys, and, and the little one was a little bit younger, like maybe eight or something, almost simultaneously said independence, like the three of them, independence. 
And they went off and explained this whole thing, but they're like, we just really value our independence. Like, and we live in a perfect city for this, in our view, like, you know, public transportation, incredible enrichment opportunities, incredible public schools. Like, they can, you know, after a certain age, like, you know, really, they can do anything they want to do. And um, so, I don't know, that, that's, that's maybe at least part of our parenting. What philosophy. was the thing they wanted you to do differently? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Um, and and, and I, if it was, okay, this kit is like Saturday game night, Saturday night game night. That's what I would do differently. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll take that. To have it or not have it? He wanted it. He oh. wanted Saturday night game night, like with the family, which is so mm -hmm. funny, because that's our date night, <laughs> which is crucial as well. <laughs> So um, one way I thought, like, how would you tra take what Wendy just described and say, like, how does this translate in, in real oh, life? No. So what are you going to do? Um, this is very Thursday, dangerous. June seventh, eight forty-eight p.m. Dad, can you bring ice cream on your way home? Smiley face, ice cream cone emojis, <laughs> two cups of ice cream. My answer: I am in California. <laughs> <laughs> To which Georgina replies, okay. <laughs> so that's our model. Um, uh, the, the, my, my, the chair of the board of KIPP, he, he says that after watching us for a few years, he said, you guys are, what you're doing is what I would call a boarding school in reverse. Like we call home, we're like, how is everything? <laughs> Did you eat? How's school? Are your teachers, are you doing your homework? Um, uh, but they're good kids nonetheless, despite us somehow, knock on wood, so far. I, I do have to follow up on this. So I feel like parenting is one thing we never teach at Wharton. And so this is a good time to get some advice for <laughs> they anyone who's... They never teach who's, any of us. This no, is a big problem. I, it's a huge problem. And for anyone who has you know, either f felt like they don't know how to raise their own children or they're wanting to give their parents some feedback about what they should have done differently, I, I, just, I just wanted to ask for your advice on a few parenting dilemmas that I'm grappling with right no. now. Oh, this is going to be a disaster. So, roll it out, roll it out. So our kids are 10, 7, and 4, and our 4-year-old asked me the other day, he said, Daddy, who made people? And I didn't really want to have a whole religion discussion with our 4-year-old, and I didn't even know what I thought anyway. And so uh, my response was, well, what do you think? And he paused for a second, and he said, Bob the Builder? <laughs> So my question is, what do I say to that? Do I affirm that? Do I challenge it? Like, what, what is the received wisdom from education experts? I'll let you do that one. It depends how tired you are. <laughs> I don't even, I can't, I don't know. What would you do? I would just say, go on the internet. <laughs> All right, one, one other that I have to ask is, we, we've all through the, been through the dilemma of wanting our kids to do things that they won't do, and, and both of you have put a huge amount of emphasis on character uh, in the way that you organize your schools and train your teachers. Um, if I want to do something as simple as like, get our daughters to clean their rooms, wh wh where do you start on that? How did you deal with that with your kids? Uh, <laughs> Richard, you, know you, to you told me, I think, a year or two ago that you were a loser parent, yes. quote. I mean, it, it, well, we were terrible. I mean, but you know what? That may not be the battle to fight. Someone once gave advice like that, right? It sounds credible. Like, I don't know. Is cleaning your room the battle to fight? I, I don't know. We just chose not to fight it. So the, the alternative, so we've, our three boys have grown up in one bedroom. So what, what I found easier is just you close the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the morning you open it and say, okay, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> I see why your schools are so popular. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I, I will, on, on the serious thing, I do think uh, this isn't the battle, you know, I think uh, we would choose to fight and I would choose to fight. I do think um, uh, the, the level of independence and autonomy is, uh, and again, we're privileged living in New York, but I think our, our kids, um, like that's the big, my biggest takeaway is by the time they leave us, there, I don't think, we'll say, like, the transition to sort of being on their own, um, I hope will be, well, we'll see how it plays out, but I think it'll be, they'll have really benefited growing up this way, and I think it's the one gift we've given them. 
So one of the things that I've been trying to figure out is we have a, a new initiative at Wharton, uh, which is a Wharton People Analytics Initiative, where Kate Massey and Angela Duckworth and I are trying to figure out how we can identify and then develop character strengths uh, in, in people ranging from students to executives and everything in between. So we want to teach grit. We'd like to teach you know, students to be givers rather than takers. Um, how do you think about doing this in your schools? And what, what, is, what have you learned about if I'm a teacher or a parent or an educator of any kind, how I instill these kinds of values and principles? So, I'll, I'll, you know, and obviously there's a, there's a lot of partnership work actually with uh, uh, Angela and the folks at, at Penn and the Character Lab. So um, we're, we're learning this, some of this together. But um, I, I think the key thing we're trying to figure out right now and we're excited about is um, we've always, I mean, since the beginning of KIPP, we're talking now 20 years, we've always believed that uh, our schools are about not just academics, but about building um, the mindsets and uh, life skills uh, that you'll take with you um, when you leave. We've talked from the very beginning with our kids about what that takes. And they've been exposed both to like projects that um, are designed to unleash things like grit, perseverance, um, potentially confidence speaking in public, working in teams. So there's all that that we're doing. I think what we haven't known and what we're still trying to, we're, we're working on and figuring out in partnership, uh, Adam, with, with you all, is what interventions actually that a teacher could do in a class pay off over time? Like, what could you actually say to a teacher? This, if you're doing this, we have research that says uh, your students will actually end up demonstrating these, these uh, attributes over time. So we don't have that research base, and I'd say the, the things we've done is actually um, extend the day, ensure our, our uh, KIPP students have exposure, not just to the core academics, but lots of co-curricular activities, opportunities to build so many of the things that um, affluent kids get every day in America. So they're playing sports, they're engaged in the arts, um, they're involved in uh, robotics teams. All the things that we know, where we believe make a difference, what we don't have yet would be just the research base to say these interventions are actually leading to this. We've taken the approach through now that you do it all, and even if we can't piece out which part contributes to which outcome, the full uh, array of the opportunity is what leads kids to be able to lead choiceful lives. So it's deep in our belief system, it's deep in the way we operate. We can't tell you which thing actually leads to which outcome. It's, it's weird though, I think even in the basic practices that, that you started with early on, extend the day is totally counterintuitive to me. Like if, if someone had said to me when I was in school, we're gonna have you go to school longer, I'm pretty sure I would have quit or rebelled. Uh, so what, why is that a good thing? Well, I'll, I'll say a couple things. One is, uh, first, and, and we know this, like our, our kids, if you want to be able to have the, the full rich experience academically, enough time to work on reading and math and science, um, but you also want um, students to be able to engage in group work and projects. You also want them to be able to do, again, athletics, the arts. Every child we're trying to figure out what is gonna bring out you know, that, uh, that which makes that you know, student feel special and successful. If you're gonna do that, you can't do that in a like nine to two school day. Most people in America know that and we all are compensating for it if we can. Like we're using our resources mm. to give our kids access to all that that the school doesn't give. We rec I mean, I give the credit to the founders of KIPP. They recognized early on, you can't do that without extending the day. I think there's a second, um, you know, and again, you're the researcher, I'm not, so I'll, I'll, I'll caveat this, but I'd say, when you speak with our alums, uh, and they talk about the longer day and the longer year, they will say, you know, um, one of the things that made me feel special was proving to myself that I could, I could do this, that I could put in the work, that I, um, could go the extra mile, and it becomes part of an, a positive identity that um, like I can, I can rise to the challenge. Recognizing, just what you said, Adam, no fifth grader in America, when they were introduced, the idea of a longer day and longer year, there's not one fifth grader in America who thinks this is a great idea. Not one, we've never met them. Their parents may think it, their grandparents may think it, they don't. But when I, when I sit with 25 year olds, it's one of the distinguishing factors. And, and part of it, is, I think, is they've also felt what they were doing was different than the norm the feeling that they were actually um, doing something that a lot of kids didn't have uh, access to, and I think it made them feel special in terms of their ability to persist and have grit and thrive. 
Wendy, what about you? You've developed some extraordinary teachers over the years. Many of them are running parts of the world today. What are some of the most unusual and effective teaching practices that you've observed in the classroom? Oh, gosh, unusual and effective. I mean, I guess, actually, I mean, when we study the most transformational teachers in the world, it's, first of all, amazing how many patterns you see across, you know, countries. I mean, it's just amazing. Like, we have one framework around, like, you know, what is it that differentiates the most transformational teachers? Um, you know, the biggest things are, first of all, relationships. Um, we did a kind of good to great teacher study along with Jim Collins some time ago, and the thing that most popped, like, that we hadn't seen before that came out of this very intensive research looking at um, kind of matched pairs of teachers, one who sort of, some who start like fantastic and others who kind of move from good to great. The biggest differentiator was that they were so relational, like with not only the kids and, and the kids' families, but with other teachers in their schools, just super relational. So developing strong relationships is, is just the foundation. Like I, I think about that, because think about the pressure our new teachers are under and how much pressure their schools, Teach for America, the next thing, put on them. You know, you feel like you're stuck in a box, and yet the key is getting outside of the box and just getting to know your kids, their families, their communities, and the other teachers in the schools. I mean, interesting. The other, another thing, I mean, there are several things, but it's just their vision orientation. You know, just their thinking about what the long term is. Like, for the kids in our classrooms today, like, you know, where, what's the vision? Like by the time they're 25, what do we want to have be true? And ideally the teacher isn't figuring that out, but it's like, you know, a lot of folks in the community are, are figuring that out, which is, is a whole other thing that we could talk about. But, um, and, and then they're thinking with a sense of urgency, you know, what are we gonna do this year that's gonna put our kids, because they're not on that path. Like, and, and really considering what are our kids currently on a path to, and what do we actually need to be doing to get on, them on a path to that? Um, those are just a couple of the things that, that are most differentiating, I would mm -hmm. say. I was surprised by some recent evidence that when students get the same teacher for multiple subjects, they actually get better grades, and that's true for math and reading, and then also if they have the same teacher for multiple years, they end up doing better, which seems to fly in the face of what most American schools are doing, but tracks with your point about relationships, right? If a teacher gets to know a student over multiple subjects or multiple years, they really get to personalize their, both their education, but also some of the, I guess, the psychological and emotional support that they provide to the student. And I guess that, that made me wonder, what else are American schools doing wrong? And what would you like to change if you both had a magic wand? Mm. Um, well, I'll share a recent story around this. Um, so I was, we were, you know, Teach for All is a network of organizations like Teach for America in 48 countries, right? So, and, and the global organization tries to help all these folks, you know, the staff members and teachers and alumni and whatnot learn from each other and learn from other experts in the world. So we were doing a kind of Teach for All talk, had, you know, many, many people online on these Zoom calls, and we're talking with this gentleman who's in charge of reimagining education in Japan. First of all, can you imagine? That, that's got to be a tough job. He just eliminated the big high stakes exam that has driven so much of the kind of, well, so much of what kind of is the legendary system in Japan. Um, but he also co-founded something called OECD 2030, which has been this effort to kind of articulate, you know, given how the world is changing, what do our education systems need to be driving at for the year 2030? And this is gonna inform the new versions of the PISA and all of this. So you can look it up, Learning Framework 2030. It's, it's, I find it to be a very inspiring and you know, it's, it's a really sophisticated way of thinking about what we need to be working towards for our kids. So when you think about where we are today, all over the world, and this framework, the implementation, like how are we gonna get on a path to that? So we asked him a question about that, like how optimistic are you that we'll really be able to build the capacity all over the world to, to start aiming at, at Education 2030, he's like, oh, you can't imagine the momentum. It, he's like, everywhere, like we're getting such embrace of this framework everywhere but in three countries. The US, the UK, and um, what was the other one? Oh, I think it was France. Um, and you know, he even said, you know, at the launch at Harvard, we had almost everyone in the room, like the big influencers in education. We had the Russians in the front row the only folks who weren't there were the folks from the U.S. Incredible. Wow. So, um, you know, 
these, our schools were created, you know, however many, a couple hundred years ago, um, when what we were wanting for our kids, what we knew they had to be able to do, the jobs we knew they had to be able to do, what we were expecting of them were uh, pretty different. Um, and I think we need to step back and really consider the question of, you know, what it is, given how the world's changing, given the actual, you know, challenges, pathways to opportunity, given where the world is going, given the increasingly complex problems facing our planet and our society, you know, what needs to be true for our 25-year-olds? And then we need to ask ourselves, are we on a path to that? Like, are we on a path to building, to, to getting our kids there? Are our school systems oriented towards a set of outcomes that will make it happen? Um, and I, I would say no. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to sound a bit redundant, but I think, um, d let me start by saying, I think there's a lot uh, of the last 15 years that we've actually done better in the U.S., and I think we've made, I'm a big believer that the standards movement's been a good thing for helping families and uh, children, in many cases, understand where they are relative to what um, the bar is for uh, thriving in America. I think there's a huge work to be done still, but I think it's been a good thing. Um, the unintended consequences, I think most schooling in America right now is feeling too narrow and short-term oriented. And so um, we have a, I would say, an unfair or competitive advantage of KIPP, which is we think about and, tr and, and stay in touch with our uh, KIPP alums, we call them KIPsters, all the way through. And so we're thinking literally all the time, the discussion is what's happening in second grade, what does that mean for fifth grade, how are we doing with our eighth graders, how are we doing with our twelfth graders? But that is, that is rare. Like, the degree to which high schools are in touch and in conversation with middle schools and elementary schools is, is not great right now. And then secondly, there's a whole other um, piece, and I think, Wendy, you're getting at this, which is in our country, like, we literally bifurcate and say, okay, there's K-12, and then there's this other thing out there. And no one's thinking, I mean, if you're a parent, we all know that your child at 17, like, they don't, in that summer, all of a sudden, magically become a different human being. We've seen that for a fact in our house. Like, they do not. And yet we operate that way. We literally operate, it's like, okay, here's one thing, we drop them off here, and then they get picked up somewhere else. And there's no sense of thinking or continuity of, of experience or intentional design. That's, I think, one of our biggest challenges. I think other countries are, my sense, my, my wife is there, out there, and I'm not, but my sense is a lot of other countries are doing more to think that long-term building with the end in mind and, and connecting the dots. Just to bring it home, um, a couple of years ago, because we lived this experience at KIPP, we tried to, we tried to, um, we were trying to sit with one of the, the biggest foundations in, in the education funding space, and we said, we want to come out and meet with you, and we really are hoping we could, we could um, have the people who do your K-12 work and the people who do your higher ed work meet with us uh, because, you know, our kids are growing up and we're grappling with that. And we spent six months trying to engineer this meeting and we got there and they said, we just, we couldn't pull it off. So on day one, you're going to meet with the K-12 people and the next day you'll meet with the higher ed team. Uh, and so we did that. And I remember sitting there and I said, we met with the higher ed people and they said, so how was it? And I said, it's really good. You know, you could have come with us, but we'll tell you what we learned from them that might inform your thinking. And I was literally imagining like they were one floor apart. That's, but they're emblematic of how bifurcated our thinking is in America. So that is a big opportunity um, for us looking ahead is thinking K-16, connecting dots between what's happening, you know, from age three and four all the way through, you know, young adulthood. So we're obviously not in a position yet where we've seen those bridges build. But you both spend a lot of time trying to prepare students for the next phase. Uh, so Richard, you focus a lot on the transition to college. Uh, Wendy, you've worked for years with teachers who spend just two years with you, and then you send them out to try to have an impact in the world. What do you think is the worst advice people get at those transition phases, and how would you edit it? You want to go work? If you have something, go, because I don't have a thought. I'll okay. make something up. We'll make something up. OK. <laughs> this is how to stay married. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, I'll just, I'll be very open about like a journey we're on at KIPP. And it's just, again, I think one of our benefits is because we're, we've been at this for so long and we stay in touch with our kids, we're, we're learning. Um, we've become as good as it gets in terms of helping uh, young adults in America, in, in our schools, 16, 17 year olds, think about how to um, apply to college, think about how to, go to the right college at the right match at the right price. 
that has the strongest outcomes. Literally, if you're a 16-year-old at KIPP and you want to go to college, um, you probably couldn't be in a better place. And we're four or five times better at providing the guidance to an 11th and 12th grader today than we were five years ago. Uh, in fact, you, for, for everyone who's attended Penn, it's our number one highly selective college partner. We now have this year, I think, 54 Kipsters at Penn. 54, it's remarkable. Um, what, what have we discovered? We haven't done quite what we need to do. It's like, I don't think our kids are leaving with a clear purpose, passion, and plan that would then actually drive them, whether they go to college or not, into what is the field of study you're going after? Why are you doing this? And so I think what, the limits of what we've done is we may have young people thinking, this is what I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to go to college next, but they're not understanding, it's like, why? And like, what am I uniquely aspiring to be? And I think what we've learned is, even if you end up changing your mind in what you want to do, you're better off leaving with a, with a plan and a sense of this is where I'm going for than not. So I think we've had huge success helping young people go to college. Uh, we haven't had a vision for them enough around what they would actually be doing after that or with that degree. And then a big gap has been, for those who don't go to college, what actually is the pathway into the modern economy? And that's what we're absolutely digging into today because it's not something America does very well. And if you want to go to college, we can do a phenomenal job providing that guidance. If you don't, and you can literally imagine a counselor with a screen at them, and I'm sitting with you, I can help you develop a wish list for colleges, I can help you think about the odds of admission, I can help you think about financial aid. If you don't want to go to college, I have no screen. There's literally the military and nothing else. And so that's where I think, you know, we, we don't quite have it right. And we've had young people who would say, I want to go to the military. We'd say, well, that's not a good idea only because it's not valued in the system, uh, and that's a miss. So I think that's a big journey we have to figure out. We're not the only ones, a lot of people in our traffic, but that's, we do not provide the best advice in terms of people thinking longer term beyond whether you, you, know, you go to college or not. So are you up for a lightning round? Yes. Is that a good yes, or, or when are you saying Richard's gonna do the lightning round? Yeah, he's good All at right. this. So uh, for, for either of you who wants to jump in on any of these, uh, first one is, are teachers in America underpaid, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, that one was easy. Uh, secondly, what's the, the one biggest mistake that you see parents make as they raise their children, as they come into your schools? Some of these are less lightning yeah, than uh, others. Uh, undervaluing their voice and their role. Like, mm -hmm. not, not being confident in terms of telling us what they want, what they need. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, what's the one country we should be learning the most from on how to do education right? Hmm. Um, uh, that's a, such a tough question because I, I think, I'm not sure I would, I can't answer that in that way because I, what I think is that there's so much to be learned. I mean, it's amazing in education. We just don't assume that we can learn from each other across borders. In health, you think, of course, the solutions are shareable, our fates are interconnected. Yeah. Same with the environment and education. We really don't <clears throat> think that way, and yet it is totally true. The solutions are far more shareable than we've assumed, and our fates are completely interconnected, which is terrifying when you get your head around the educational outcomes in some parts of the world. Um, but I think, you know, the thing is that many countries, there's no country I know of that's satisfied with where it is. And, but what there is to be learned from is kind of the, sh the incredible, like, incredible examples of tremendous educational opportunity that exist in many different countries in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and again, to stay on the theme of, well, empowering students and whatnot, like, I, I think one of the most interesting things I'm seeing right now is is these experiments different folks are running that put kids much more in charge of their own learning, their own, like, reforming the system even. I mean, I, I just, you know, spent some time with some folks who designed a school. I mean, the school was designed by kids, and these kids were ages six to nine. They Where was They co-create lesson plans. This was in Latvia, and it was in the hands of a, a kind of Teach for Latvia teacher who was one of the 50 Global Teacher Prize winners, but... I mean, she literally, they co-create lesson plans with the kids. The kids pick the standard and the topic, and then a teacher and a kid work together to do it. When they need resources for anything, the kids write emails. I mean, we're sitting there in a session listening to this kid describe this, 
And this gentleman who was starting Teach for Uganda was sitting there shaking his head saying, our seniors, the people who are graduating, which is very few, don't know how to write an email. So it's just, it's, we underestimate our kids. And, and that's, that's one of our biggest thoughts, even as parents. Like, you just constantly realize it. Like, oh my gosh, like, you know, what kids are capable of. And, and we're really underestimating them really all over the world in, in schools. But so, those are some of the things I'm looking most at right now across the world. So you made a funny comment backstage, which is that you don't normally appear on stage together, but that this was an excuse to find out what your partner was doing <laughs> <laughs> and catch up a little bit. Uh, I want to give you a chance to deliver on that. Uh, you can each ask each other one question. <laughs> oh my goodness. Are you having fun? In life or right now? Right now. <laughs> um, I'm glad it's Friday afternoon and I'm home in New York instead of on an airplane. So yeah, I'm having enough fun. Um, I'm done. <laughs> um, what do I want to ask you, Richard? What, 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 what are you most thinking about, like right now? What, what would you most like to share with this group? See, that's the question you should have asked me. Let me take <laughs> rewind the clock. Uh, when, what, are you, what, are you, what are you most thinking about? <laughs> He's such a good no, learner. Seriously, so one impressive. of the things I was sitting up here thinking about is that, because <laughs> this is pretty much, yeah. Um, was happy wife, happy this life. This conversation can be, it can feel so removed from, as you know, some realities out there in the world. And one thing I've been thinking a lot about, um, we have three incredible network partners, Teach for Nigeria, Teach for Uganda, and Teach for Ghana. This is the least populated Teach for All region of the world. Like We're just getting started in Africa. But I've been thinking with them about the magnitude of the challenge ahead on this continent. And I kind of just want to put this out there because I think for our collective welfare, we need to be thinking about this stuff. Um, like 1.2 billion people live today on the continent of Africa, and that is going to be 2.4 billion, twice as many, 2.4 billion by 30 years from now. And the context for this is that the educational infrastructure in Africa is so weak right now. And you know, there was just a World Bank report. There are no, no good data, but this World Bank report looked deeply at learning outcomes in seven countries and found that in five of the seven, fewer than 10% of fourth graders can read a paragraph. So, you know, you just think about, you know, for so many kids and families, for the countries and for our world, we had better, they had better. I mean, it, it's gonna have to, I mean, Ugandans are gonna solve Uganda's problems, but how is this gonna work? Um, you know I, know, I believe one of the key elements is we need as many people as are channeling their energy. I mean, there are lots of well-educated Africans. They're incredible, they're dynamic, and they're channeling their energy into, you know, banks and oil and gas companies and cell technology companies and, and all, um, and we need a good fair share of them to channel their energy against this fundamental issue. Um, and it's hard to figure out how that happens um, given the lack of financial resources and the way the foreign aid money flows at this point. So anyway, there's just a lot of pressing issues. Um, you know, we can think about our own education and I think we need to really wake up and realize that we need to do much better and do much differently in the US, but we also should be thinking about education in, in these other countries. Mm -hmm. Richard, are you gonna answer it? Answer my question. Okay. Um, so short answer, slightly long answer. Short answer because uh, Adam, you asked this question, are teachers paid enough? They're not. And for anyone who's involved in healthcare out there, I just add, I hope you're working these solutions because um, one of the major challenges we have is just the cost of healthcare. In Philadelphia, where many of you went to school, uh, this year we're opening a new school in North Philadelphia. Our average teacher makes $60,000. The cost to the school in the school budget this year will be just under $100,000. We opened a new school in Philadelphia in 2010, not that long ago. The cost of the school budget was in the low 80s, around 82, 83. So the teacher's not making any more money. The school is not getting another person. In fact, we'll probably have to hire one or two fewer people to work in the school because of that. So I just, I name that because teachers aren't paid enough, but we've got to figure out 
how to solve these escalating costs that are just chewing up you know, all, all these spends out there. Yeah. Um, if you said what's, what's uh, you know, what am I thinking about a lot? You know, this year I visited uh, 20 of our high schools across the country, um, meet all these amazing juniors and seniors, that was my focus. Um, so much, uh, so much talent. And um, one thing I'm struck by is I, st you know, I, I think deep down still, too many people who have a lot of influence and power think we're operating in a meritocracy. And, you know, there are elements in which things are meritocratic, but in general, um, the, the, the reality is, you know, and if you look at like this work out of this guy, Raj Chetty, out at Stanford right now, yep. you are, looking at this last year, you are 77 times more likely to go to an Ivy or an Ivy Plus school, the most selective schools in America, if you're from the top 1%, than if you grow up in the bottom 20%. You're 77 more times. And I think somehow still enough people must think there's something else going on that then justifies it. And um, so, you know, if I said like, what I hope people keep thinking about is, there's gotta be something, you know, there that's making this something far less than mer meritocratic. And um, even if you just said, and I was talking actually to Wendy about this, I heard this, this professor speaking about this, even if you said, even at Wharton or Stanford, pick any of them, uh, we're gonna do this experiment where the next class of kids we take is gonna take the top, you know, five or 10% of the kids from each quintile economically in the country. So you gotta be in the top 5% or 3%, whatever number, crazy number you want for your selectivity goal, but you distribute it um, across the, the income divide. Maybe that would be an interesting test for us to start thinking about this way, but that's, you know, I just look at what's, what's going on out there, and, and it can't be good, just as Wendy says, it can't be good for the world to have what's going on out there globally in education. It, it, can't, it can't be viable for our country to have this level, if the odds are 77 times greater, for people to believe there's some real deal in this anymore. I think at some point people are gonna say there just is no, there is no deal. So that's the thing I'm thinking a lot about, is like, how do we just make sure people aren't thinking there's, there's, there's some form of meritocracy in places where we're far from it. Fast closing question. We have a lot of influence in this room. What can the people here do to improve the future of education? Um, go ahead. Uh, you know, my easy, like, I just encourage people, if, and so many of you in this room are already doing it probably, just proximity, our, our, my life experience, our life experiences, I meet, like, KIPP wouldn't exist if amazing people um, for the last 20 years hadn't gotten proximate and decided, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into this in a big way. Um, and uh, that proximity, wh wh whatever your thing is, you know, for us it's education. When you start meeting young people, you start meeting teachers, or you start meeting schools, or you start seeing what's going on, for a whole bunch of people, it becomes, you know, it's hard not to become obsessed. Um, and so, however, if you're ever like, hey, what do I do with my time this year, when I think about where my time goes, if you have chances to go out, touch people, get connected, listen, watch. Um, I think it's the number one thing you can do. I think when you're proximate, the odds that you're gonna bring a conviction and a passion and all your talent to it goes up dramatically. I second that and um, I'd also just say, think about like as you explore and learn and some of you are probably already deep in on this whole journey, but um, you know, find your way to those kind of social entrepreneurs out there and get behind them. You know, I. I think about what really changes things, what cha puts things on a different trajectory, and I, I doubt anyone would question in the for-profit sector, it's entrepreneurs, you know. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence that social entrepreneurs are the folks with the real potential to actually put us on a different trajectory, and they're terribly underfinanced. Like, you think about how much time a for-profit entrepreneur spends raising money and how much time the social entrepreneurs do, I mean, it's like, 50, 75% or more of their time is just like trying to find funding. And I just think we have a lot of folks out there and a lot of philanthropists and a lot of people figuring out their own things. And I, I you know, I would just look, try to get out there and figure out who's doing the great work, who's, who's just way underfinanced. Because I, I think that has, if we had a lot more people thinking that way, I think we would make a lot more progress. Well, I want to thank you both, both for joining us today and also for the extraordinary work you've done in education. Richard, Wendy, thank you. Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.